Cindy Bergdorf is um, a master gardener. She's been a master gardener for 15 years. She has year-round vegetable gardens, uh, gardens devoted to bees and butterflies, which she's going to talk about today. She has five beehives, six chickens, a worm bin, and six compost bins. Her yard is a monarch way station, a certified butterfly garden, a certified wildlife habitat, and certified bee-friendly garden. So welcome, Cindy. Thank you. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, modern technology. And here we are. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, clicked in early and uh, Zoom said I had to restart my computer and there we are. So today we're going to talk about gardening for bees and butterflies. Um, I want, um, as <clears throat> Dorla said, I'm with the uh, UCC E Master Gardeners. Uh, we are a volunteer organization under the umbrella of the UC uh, system. Uh, our function is to take the knowledge that is uh, in the University of California agriculture system uh, for commercial farmers and translate that into information that you can use in your backyard. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm a master gardener in San Mateo, San Francisco counties. Uh, we have three mornings a week that we have um, somebody online or on the telephone to answer questions. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us. You can, uh, our offices are currently closed uh, to outsiders, but we should be opening soon. We have a website um, and we have lots of available information for you. So today we're gonna talk about um, uh, who do we want to attract? Before you can actually get uh, wildlife into your garden, you have to know what their needs and requirements are. So we're going to talk about bees, butterflies, and I've also thrown in hummingbirds since they have some of the same characteristics. Um, all right. So how do we attract them? First, we have to know something about their life cycles. Uh, are they short? Are they long? Um, do they come in different requirements? And then what are their habitat requirements? The four basic wildlife needs that all wildlife needs are food, water, cover, and space. So if you're trying to attract wildlife, or if you're trying to not attract wildlife, uh, these are the things you need to know and cover. Uh, so let's start with bees. There are over 1600 different species of California native bees. Most of them are solitary nesters and are non-aggressive. That means that they live by themselves. They do not have a hive. They do not have a colony, they, they're individuals, and because they don't have a hide to protect, they're non-aggressive. European honeybees are the only ones that live in large hives and defend them. The Western or European honeybee is worldwide. There were no honeybees in America before the Europeans arrived. Now, how they got those bees all around the world by ship, um, I wouldn't wanna have to do it myself, but they did it. They got bees all over the world. They're identical uh, wherever they go. So the season for honeybees is year round. Uh, there's three casts, there's a queen, there's workers, and then there's the male drones. Queens and workers are all females. Um, a, a queen can live for several years and produce eggs. Uh, they nest in large cavities in trees, in the ground, 
in your buildings. Uh, I've had them in my attic, uh, in my, under my roof before, or in hive boxes, which is what you see commercial beekeepers keep. They <clears throat> don't have any particular preferred flowers. They're generalists. They're looking for nectar and pollen wherever they can get it. Now, native bees, as I said, there's 4,000 species native to the US, 1,600 native to California. Of those 1,600, 26 are different kinds of bumblebees. All of the rest are solitary bees. So let's talk about some solitary bees. These are the California cousins to the honeybees. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about digger bees, carpenter bees, and bumblebees. All right, there's 40 species of digger bees uh, in California. Their season, when you're gonna see them be active, is either March to June or May to October. They generally have one or two generations per year. So the bees will come out of hibernation, they will prepare a nest. They will lay eggs. Those eggs will pupate. They'll become bees and they'll fly off and start over again. Bigger bees nest in flat bare ground or in the vertical banks of, of, a, um, of a creek. So if you have the, the, the creek sides, they'll bore into the ground there or in the in the ground on flat ground. Um, you'll see them coming out of the ground. You, you can also see uh, other kinds of insects come out of the ground. So you have to look and see if they have stripes, black and white stripes, and they will be uh, digger bees. <laughs> so ground nesters need a clear, or a slightly weedy dirt area to dig in and to lay their eggs. The bee on the left is actually, a, a, I believe a carpenter bee, which will go into um, pith or bamboo or something, something that's hollow or they'll, or they'll um, actually carve out a hollow space themselves. The one in the middle is a digger bee and on the right is a picture of what it looks like on the ground after the bee has dug out uh, a hole for her to lay her eggs. She'll, she'll uh, <clears throat> lay the eggs, then she'll go and get nectar and pollen and make kind of a bee bread, seal the, seal the egg into the hole, lay another egg, seal it in and back out of the, the hole that she's made after she's laid several um, eggs. The first, the first um, eggs or the first bees that come out of the hole will be males. And they'll be waiting for the females to come out uh, to mate with them. Carpenter bees, we have three species in California. Uh, they're year round, but the peak when you see them the most is March to August. They're solitary and they're long live. Uh, once they find an area that they like, they will uh, come back um, or stay in that area over and over again. Um, in my backyard, I have carpenter bees that are uh, digging into the support from my solar for my swimming pool. And underneath that support, you can see lots of sawdust. So I always know when they're active because I can see the redwood sawdust on the ground from them digging the holes. They drill it into soft wood or pithy stems. And um, when, when I come out to my backyard and I go by the, the gate there, um, sometimes they'll be waiting, the, the males will be waiting out there, or they'll fly around my head. Most solitary bees or many solitary bees do not have stingers. 
So they really are not a threat to you at all. Um, sometimes they'll fly around my head like they're trying to chase me away, um, but I've never had one even touch me um, before. Bumblebees, we have 26 species in California. These are annual colonies. They're not a hive per se, and they're present most of the flowering season. They have queens, workers, and drones, and all of them forage or go out and collect uh, nectar or po and pollen at some point in their life. Um, the way it works is that the queen will hibernate uh, over the winter, usually under leaves or in um, um, a pile of leaves or someplace like that where it can stay um, dry and out of the wind. And then in the springtime, when they start to come out, they'll be very hungry. So they're gonna be looking for nectar and pollen, build up their strength. Then they're gonna go and look for a spot for a nest. Um, they like uh, underground locations like abandoned rodent burrows or bird nests and cavities, uh, bird houses sometimes they'll go to. Um, so she'll go, she'll find a place for a nest, create a nest. Um, then she's going to go and collect pollen and nectar and um, build a small bowl that she will fill with nectar. Then she'll sit down next to that bowl and uh, lay, start to lay eggs. She'll lay a mass of eggs and then she'll sit on them um, almost like a bird would do uh, to keep them warm. And then she will eat uh, nectar out of the bowl that she's sitting next to until the larvae hatch. Um, once they develop into bees, uh, then those become the worker bees and they go out and bring back nectar and pollen for her uh, to feed her and also to feed the new babies that come along. Uh, the difference between bumblebees and honeybees is that um, the workers only collect the um, nectar and pollen to feed themselves, the queen and the baby bees. They do not store their honey at all, um, like in a hive, like you'd see in the cells of a honeybee. So it's a very temporary uh, operation. Um, when, they, when it gets to the end of the season, she'll lay special eggs that will become future queens. They fly off, they mate with the drones, and then they go and hibernate. So don't be too eager to uh, sweep up all your leaves because you may sweep up a, a bumblebee queen to be. Um, this is a bumblebee. You can see she's got pollen on her, on her back and on her legs. Um, they tend to be very fluffy looking. Um, there's actually a um, bumblebee that's called a teddy bear. And uh, that's the name of <laughs> the particular uh, species because they're so fat and fluffy. So now we're gonna talk about uh, butterflies for the garden. Uh, here are six uh, species that are native to uh, the Bay Area. You've probably seen these um, at some time in your garden or your neighbor's garden. Here are six more common Bay Area butterflies. As you can see, they come in lots of different colors and sizes from a quarter of an inch uh, to a wingspan of two and a half or three inches. Uh, there's 20,000 species of butterflies in the world, 575 in the US and around 150 species are native uh, to the Bay Area. Many of them are year round because of our climate um, that we have here. 
they never quite leave us. <clears throat> However, we have the highest density of endangered species in the US. And that's primarily because of lack of habitat. And I want you to know that one person, you can make a difference. And in a little bit, I'll tell you about a person who did just that. Um, the key to attracting, uh, there's several things to attracting uh, butterflies. Each species has a preferred host plant. This is the plant that they lay their eggs on. It's the only food for that caterpillar or that butterfly caterpillar. So they won't, they won't lay them on anything that is not their host plant. Uh, adults are less picky. Uh, almost any nectar plant will feed them. But if you really, really want butterflies in your garden, you have to include their host plant. So let's start with monarch butterflies. This is, um, their Latin name is Greek for sleeping transformation. So this is the life cycle of a monarch butterfly. It's also very, it's very similar to most uh, butterflies. Um, the adult female will lay an egg. Uh, it takes three to five days for the egg to hatch. Uh, the primary difference usually is the weather, the temperature. Uh, the warmer it is, the faster they um, pupate. Uh, then they become a larvae. They're in that stage for um, nine days to two weeks. Then they go into a chrysalis for another week to two weeks. Again, depending upon the temperature. Then they become an adult and they live somewhere between two to six weeks. So that's the life cycle of a monarch butterfly. Uh, this is the size of an egg on the underside of a milkweed leaf. You can see with the comparison to the uh, pencils there that they're very, very small, white, uh, the monarch butterfly lays one egg at a time. Uh, she'll move around to different um, uh, leaves to, to lay an egg. She'll rest on top of the leaf and her back end body will, will curl under the leaf and she'll lay an egg. This is what they, a monarch egg looks like under magnification. It's really kind of a beautiful, um, a beautiful specimen. But it's a tough life out there for our monarchs. Eggs are only laid on milkweed. So the less milkweed we have, the less eggs we have laid. Uh, in the old days, there used to be milkweed all over California. It would be in the drainage ditches. It'd be alongside of the road. It'd be everywhere you can find. Um, but because of spraying and destroying those habitats, we don't have as much wild milkweed as we used to. Only three to 5% of the eggs that are laid actually survive to be an adult. It's due to the predators, uh, everything from spiders to lizards to birds to people, <laughs> uh, weather, disease, lack of milkweed and pesticides um, are what kill them before they um, survive to an adult. Their habitat is disappearing and <clears throat> they're very, um, it's very hard to find wild milkweed out in the wild uh, anymore. Uh, monarchs were declared endangered in 2022 by the International Conservation Organization, uh, but not by the US or by California. 
Um, the United States said in 2019 that they were going to, uh, that, 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 that uh, the monarch butterfly had um, achieved a status that entitled it to be declared um, endangered. But because they had too many other animals that were also endangered, they could not spare the resources to actually declare monarch butterflies endangered. So um, civilians have to take up the slack here uh, because it's not going to happen um, by our conservation groups. This is what a, a monarch caterpillar goes through five instars in about two weeks. What that means is the caterpillar will eat and grow, then it will um, break its skin and slough that off, then it will eat and grow again. You can see here the five stages that it goes through from a little tiny, um, where it says number one, to the huge number five. Does that in two weeks. You can imagine if you grew that fast. Um, and after it goes through the fifth instar, it's going to attach itself with a little silk to the underside of a pot, uh, a branch, uh, on, a, on a tree, um, <coughs> under brickwork, uh, under your eaves, uh, wherever it can find a, a protected place. It will then uh, turn into this J shape like this. And so you know it's getting ready to turn into a chrysalis. And then it goes through this process, you can see taken here in different photographs, uh, to turn into the final chrysalis. This happens in about two minutes. So if you're if you're watching and you see this caterpillar turn into a J, don't go away because it's very shortly going to turn into a chrysalis and you'll miss the whole show. So the host plant is milkweed, 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 milkweed. No milkweed, no monarchs. There are over a hundred varieties of milkweed that are native to the US. 16 varieties that are native to California. I'm gonna talk about them later and show you some pictures. There's many environmental and climate choices since they have grown all over California. This is a Western tiger swallowtail, also a very common uh, butterfly in uh, the Bay Area. This is what the caterpillar of a Western tiger swallowtail looks like. So if you see this scary little guy looking at you from your garden, um, just know that this is a Western tiger swallowtail. And those eyes are actually to scare away birds and other animals that <clears throat> it wants to think it's looking at them. This is what the chrysalis of a Western tiger swallowtail looks like. You can notice that it has uh, thin strands here that are holding it to the stem. These are called girdles and kind of tie it to the um, su substance. You notice that it looks like a, a dried up leaf and it, and it mimics leaves on plants. So another, this is another reason why you have to be careful about cleaning up leaves in the fall. If at all possible, leave leaves, dried leaves, wherever they are uh, for the fall into the winter, and they will they'll come out of their chrysalis uh, in the springtime or whenever it's ready. Actually, swallowtails can actually stay in their chrysalis a couple of years. So depending upon the temperature and what the weather's like, they'll, they'll come out when it's the right time for them. 
The host plants for Western tiger swallowtails are all trees. Most of them are large trees, sycamore, ash, willow, lilacs, cherries, privets, cottonwoods, elders, ashmans. These are big trees. So for the most part, unless you have one growing in your yard already, you're probably unlikely to plant a sycamore tree, for example. Uh, maybe a cottonwood if you need a windbreak or something like that. But if you ever are in a position to recommend plants for a park or a, a big garden, a large acreage, wherever you can, particularly if it's near uh, a creek, uh, these are some trees that I would recommend that you plant to encourage our Western swallowtails. Uh, this is an anis swallowtail. Notice that its wings are a little little thicker, a little thinner, not quite as fat, and it has blue on it. <clears throat> this is what a caterpillar from the Anna swallowtail looks like. It's kind of scary looking, um, but it, and it's orange and black and white so that you can identify it. It looks a little furry. This is what the swallow, Anna swallowtail uh, chrysalis looks like, very similar to the tiger swallowtail. Again, it's attached with girdles. Host plants for Anna swallowtails are anise, which is fennel, uh, and all of the plants of that family, like dill, parsley, carrots, celery, parsnips. They also um, like citrus, like lemon and oranges. So you shouldn't spray any of those plants because <clears throat> they're natural ho host plants. Um, parsley is a one season plant. It will come back the second year and flower. So it's not good for uh, using for culinary purposes the second year. I always leave my parsley though to overwinter and bloom so that the Anna swallowtails have something to look for. This is a California pipe vine swallowtail. They're blue on their back and they have, um, then they're blue with orange spots on the underside of their wing. I'd like you to meet Tim Wong. He's a art aquatic biologist with the San Francisco Academy of Sciences. Um, and he noticed uh, when he was growing up that um, the pipe vine swallowtails were one of his favorites, but he noticed as he got older that he saw less and less of them. So he decided to do something about it. So he went to the botanical gardens in San Francisco and he got some pipe vines plus a lot of other nectar plants. He built a butterfly shelter in his backyard. And then he was able to get some caterpillars from um, the pipe vine. Uh, they're not very common in the Bay Area anymore. Uh, but he was able to find some, again, at the botanical gardens and also some in Northern California. And I think he started with a couple of dozen caterpillars to begin with in this shelter. And then he raised more and more and then he's been releasing them um, at the botanical gardens. Uh, there's an area in the botanical gardens where it's kind of on a um, um, terraced area so that you can walk uh, through the area and there's pipe vine growing below you and above you. And there's signs that say, watch for caterpillar crossing. And you can see the, the butterflies flying around there and laying their eggs on the pipe vine. Um, this is how the pipe vine swallowtail lays her eggs. She lays them in, in clusters. Uh, this is different than the monarch and the swallowtails that lay their eggs singly, but these are in bunches. 
Um, this is what the California pipevine swallowtail caterpillar looks like, um, kind of similar to the Anna swallowtail, except not furry. And here is a bunch of caterpillars together, just like the eggs hatch together, the caterpillars all stay together too as they're eating uh, the leaves of the pipevine. This is what the chrysalis of the pipevine caterpillar or pipevine butterfly looks like. Uh, again, similar to the swallowtails. Also, again, they stay together and you'll see them commonly in, a, in an area clustered together. But kind of pretty. This is what the flower of the California pipevine looks like. It looks like an old fashioned Dutch pipe. Another um, butterfly that you're gonna see in your garden is the West Coast Lady. Her uh, caterpillar is very furry. Uh, you should be careful when you see caterpillars that are furry like this because often their those spines are actually can actually hurt you or they have a um, chemical in them that will irritate your your skin. So I wouldn't handle them if I were you. The host plants for the West Coast Lady are hollyhocks and the mallow family. Hollyhocks and mallow are related, uh, obviously. Cabbage whites, seen those before. Their caterpillar either looks like this, yellow and black, or green. And they're also known as loopers because they kind of loop up their body as they move along. The host plants are um, uh, spider flower, and then mustard, cabbage, broccoli, kale, all the brassicas, cauliflower are uh, plants that the cabbage whites like. So if you don't want cabbage white uh, caterpillars on your cabbage, then you should cover your cabbage with floating row covers um, when you start seeing the butterflies around to keep them off of there. Uh, so that you don't, so this is a case where knowing um, what's laying those caterpillars will, you can help you keep them off of your plants if you want to. So if something is not eating your plants, then your garden is not part of the ecosystem because it's all part of nature. So let me quickly go through hummingbirds. Um, We're very fortunate in the Bay Area. Uh, Allens are common only in California. They're especially concentrated in the Bay Area and they're typically year round. Uh, black chin is the most common hummer in Western United States. It's found throughout California. Like butterflies, they are going to migrate from the coast up to the Sierra Mountains and also north to Oregon, Washington, and into Canada. Anna's hummingbirds are the greatest consumer of insects of all of the hummers. Uh, they're very common in California and um, they sing more than any other hummingbird. You'll hear them in your garden when they're around. <clears throat> hummingbirds are very, very unique. They can fly forward, backward, up and down like a helicopter. They have a very, very strong wings. Uh, however, they cannot walk. Uh, they can perch on a branch, but they cannot walk on the ground uh, like other birds can. Um, <clears throat> Some of the hummingbird favorites, um, they particularly look for plants that have long necks that they can insert their long beak and tongue into. Their tongue is so long 
that it actually wraps around inside of their head like you would a hose on a hose ring where you can wind up the hose. That's kind of how their tongue works. So they like things like trumpet vines, fuchsias, lantanas, uh, columbine, delphiniums, hollyhocks, salvias, California fuchsias. Uh, these are all um, favorites of hummingbirds. However, insects are vital to hummingbirds. 80% of their diet is insects, not nectar. They require protein for energy and for maintaining those muscles in their chest and their wings. They can eat three times their weight in insects every day. So they're really great to have in your garden uh, for insect control. They like all kinds of insects. They like spiders, they like aphids, they like <clears throat> beetles, they like all kinds of things in the garden. Spiders are their multi-purpose favorites. Again, they, they eat insects for protein. They can catch insects in mid-flight. They can catch insects right out of a spider web, including the spider. They use the web for building their nest and attaching it to trees. Um, the spider web is very resilient. It stretches. So they use it in the building of their nest so that their nest will stretch after they lay a couple of eggs and the, the babies hatch, this, the nest will actually stretch to be big enough to hold them all in the nest. So it, it's very, uh, spiders are vital uh, for hummingbirds. Hummingbird nectar, we can get lots of different kinds of feeders. Um, there's lots of choices out there. Hummingbirds are not particularly um, picky. The picture on the far top left is an Oriole. They also eat um, out of hummingbird feeders. They like the uh, nectar water. Um, the, all you should use for feeding your hummingbirds in a feeder is white sugar and water. The formula is four to one, one cup sugar to four cups water. Um, I boil it just to make sure that the sugar completely dissolves. Then I let it cool and I put it in the, in the feeder. You should make sure that you clean your feeder on a regular basis so that you don't make the hummingbirds sick. Uh, don't use, don't, you do not use the need to use dye. Don't worry, they know what's in the feeder. And actually, um, there's some evidence that the the food the red food dye is not good for hummingbirds. So I'm going to go through a number of things that will help you improve your habitat for bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Number one, no pesticides. Um, I've rearranged my list here a number of times over the last five years or so that I've been teaching this class and pesticides are now number one on my list. Pesticides kill very well. Bees, butterflies, caterpillars, beneficial insects, other pollinators, these are all things that pesticides kill. This includes safe or organic pesticides like BT, insecticidal soap, dormant oil spray, spinosad, and pyrethrin. They're, they're considered safe for you, for people. They are not safe for caterpillars or butterflies or bees. Particularly neonectoids, which are the most widely used insecticides in the world. They've now been banned in the European Union um, because no part of the plant is safe for pollinators. Neonectoids work by being sprayed on a plant 
when they then they absorb the pesticide into their leaves, into their stem, into their nectar, into every their roots, every part of the plant um, becomes um, filled with pesticides. But these pesticides, there are about 15 of them. They all have long names. You'll never remember any of them. They're long lived. They can persist in the environment for months or years. They're water soluble, so they can be taken up by other nearby plants. They contaminate the watershed and they can poison ground dwelling bees. Um, this is a tag that I got off of a plant <clears throat> at Home Depot. This very helpfully tells you that this plant has been has been treated with neonectoids. Um, and it yes, it will kill aphids, white flies, beetles, and beetle bugs. They are treated with neonectoids for the benefit of the commercial grower because it keeps the bugs off of the plants when they're growing them. There is nothing that you can do to get it off of this plant. You can't wash it off and you can't treat it. Um, Home Depot, Lowe's, some of the uh, Costco, some of the other big box stores said a number of years ago that they were phasing out um, neonectoids being sprayed on their plants. Uh, it's a little hard to tell. Uh, the people who work at these places don't know what the growers used on the plants when they were being grown. Uh, so it's more, we need to put pressure on these growers not to spray these plants because they contaminate your garden. <clears throat> Good bugs know how to find bad bugs. Plants send out a distress signal when they're being attacked. The poop of bad bugs is a lure to good bugs. You can let nature claim your garden, or you can take a master gardener class on integrated pest management and find out how to get rid of things like um, aphids and other things that come in your garden. Number two, ditch the lawn. Lawns use up huge amounts of water. If you don't compost, you're adding to the landfill. And unless you have lots and lots of dandelions, your pollinators are not interested in your yard. This is not a pollinator friendly garden. This is a pollinator garden, pollinator friendly garden. Lots of variety, lots of colors, lots of different heights. This is a pollinator friendly garden. Again, very colorful, different uh, varieties and different heights. This is a side yard. It has exactly five different plants in it. They're all pollinator friendly plants. These are all favorites of pollinators. Um, but it shows that you can have a very small garden with a small number of plants and be pollinator friendly. You can have a container pollinator friendly garden. You can have one container pollinator friendly garden. Just depends on what you plant. You need to plant for all seasons. Pollen and nectar are needed from early spring to late fall. Remember that their life cycles go from early spring to late fall for one or another of these pollinators. You want something blooming in every season. If I had to divide it up, I'd say 10% blooming in the spring, 40% summer blooming, and 50% fall blooming, because this is when the numbers of the pollinators are at the greatest, and also the need is the greatest as they're, they're gathering or storing up for winter. Here are three native plants that bloom in the early spring. 
Now you don't need to plant only natives to attract pollinators, but natives are a good choice because they're, they're around. Ceanothus comes in a variety of colors, white, lavender, all different shades of blue. They, they grow from ground covers to plants that are 30 feet high. So there are hundreds of different kinds of ceanothus. They're native to California. They're, they're all kinds of choices to put in your yard. Uh, Ribes is a, also a native, and it comes in white, pink, red, uh, those kinds of colors. It's very colorful uh, and very attractive. Uh, they like a little more shade, so it's it's they like maybe a little morning sun, afternoon shade, uh, but a good cho choice for your garden. Hellebores also like a little shade and they come in a variety of colors. Um, some other early season plants are valerian, also known as Jupiter's beard. They come in white, pink, and rosy red. Uh, snapdragons come in all different colors. Snap, snapdragons, as we know them today, are hybridized, but snapdragons are originally a native plant. Uh, Cosmos comes in lots of different colors of uh, whites and pinks and uh, reds. They all, there's also a yellow uh, Cosmos. Yarrow, uh, nice and flat top. Butterflies love them for perching on them. They come in a variety of colors, uh, white, yellow, uh, pink, red, um, kind of a burnished, burnished orange color, um, lots of different colors. And uh, they're very, very hardy, uh, low water requirements, a good, um, a good all around plant for your garden. <clears throat> Monarda, bee balm, uh, obviously bees like them. They come in a number of different colors also. And salvias or sage, come in all different sizes, all different colors, um, lots of different choices for your yard. Uh, Echinacea, asters, and bainite salvia. Uh, I have all three of these in my butterfly garden. Uh, asters um, actually bloom in the late summer, early fall. So they're a good choice for that time of year. Um, Echinacea is a butterfly favorite May night salvias, the hummingbirds and butterflies, um, bees, bees love it a lot. Here's three more plants I have in my garden. Uh, cat mint, uh, I have it all along the edge of my butterfly garden. Uh, it, it's a very hardy plant. Um, it overwinters well and then uh, it kind of dies back in the winter and then comes in the spring. Mine is just coming out now. <clears throat> so I can prune off all the old dead wood from last year and let the new growth come through. Um, cat mint comes mainly in a blue color, but I, I think you can also get it in white and lavender. Tetonia is also known as Mexican sunflower. Uh, butterflies, hummingbirds, they all love this plant. They're all over it. Sticky monkey flower is a California native that comes in lots of different colors, white, pinks, yellows, reds, um, lots of choices. And these I have all in my garden as well. I have lots of salvias and sages because they're so adaptable. Russian sage um, looks be beautiful if you make it in a hedge or in a cluster. Hot lip salvias love the sun and they'll grow just about anywhere. All the salvias are drought tolerant, easy to grow. Chiapa sage likes a little bit of sage, uh, shade, uh, but it's very lovely, comes in pink. Jerusalem sage is yellow. You can see salvias and, and sages come in lots of different colors and varieties. So they don't look the same, they, they'll look like different plants in your garden. More salvia, these I have in my yard as well. Pineapple sage, 
Pineapple sage can grow to be about three or four feet tall. If you have a large stand of it, you'll have hummingbirds all summer long. They're really gorgeous when they're blooming. Uh, hummingbird sage um, is a low grower and it grows well under oak trees. It needs minimal uh, water in the summertime. So it's a good choice for growing under oak trees. And velvet sage uh, is a very popular plant and um, is very drought tolerant. So you wanna get their attention. Bees like purple, blue, violet, yellow, and white. Hummingbirds prefer red and then yellow, orange, pink, and purple. Butterflies like pink, white, purple, red, etc. You want to plant in groups of three to five plants at a minimum um, so that you have a good amount of plants to really get their attention. A broad swath, swath of color lures them in and uh, gets their attention. This is a good example of a garden that has good concentration of plants. You can see why a bee or a butterfly would be able to really hone in on these plants because they're very visual in this garden. You wanna skip hybridized plants. Pretty double flowers are useless to pollinators. That's because these plants produce extra petals instead of anthers, which are the pollen producers of, the, of your plant. As a result, they produce very little nectar or pollen. This is an old fashioned cosmos. You can very clearly see uh, the nectar and the, the pollen in the center of the plant. Also known as uh, it looks like a target. So it's very easy for the bees and the butterflies to know where to go and to target what they need. This is a hybridized cosmos. As you can see, you can hardly see the center of the plant at all. It's not easy for the bee or butterfly to, to find it if there's anything there. Here's a perfect zinnia. Notice once again, how it looks like a target. This is what hybridizing does to the plant. Going, going, gone, gone. No, no uh, pollen at all in these plants at all. Another way to encourage um, pollinators to your yard is to plant herbs, rosemary, oregano, chives, borage, thyme, parsley. Uh, borage is a particular favorite of bees. Um, however, you need to be aware that once you plant borage, you'll never not have borage in your yard. It um, self, um, grows very, self seeds um, very easily. However, the bees love it. It's very easy to pick, pull out. Uh, my chickens love the leaves. So if I have some where I don't want them, I just give, give the leaves, give the plants to my chickens. Um, another thing that's remarkable about borage is how fast it recreates nectar. Um, one of the reasons that uh, bees cover the um, borage plants and, <clears throat> and others like rosemary is that they, re, they um, reproduce their pollen, their nectar very quickly after a bee comes and takes them. It takes borage two minutes to replace the nectar. So it's a great plant for attracting bees and butterflies. And you're gonna to wanna to plant the host plants. As I said before, milkweed is what you, is a good choice for nectar. Uh, lots of different bees and butterflies can use it for nectar as well as being a host plant for monarchs. There are 16 varieties that are native to California. As I've said before, um, lots of choices. 
This is um, a butterfly weed. It comes in this uh, yellow, orangish uh, color combinations. Uh, Mexican or narrow leaf uh, milkweed is kind of a whitish pink. Showy milkweed is kind of a lavender color, very different looking, however. Swamp milkweed is kind of a pinkish lavender color. Uh, you do not need a swamp, however, to grow swamp milkweed, nor does it need an abnormal amount of water. Purple milkweed. Tropical milkweed, which comes in yellow and orange and kind of a reddish color. Um, tropical milkweed, you don't need to worry about it being tropical. Um, it will overwinter just fine in California. However, because it does overwinter, the other milkweeds will die back in the wintertime. So there is no foliage alive. Tropical milkweed does not uh, do that. So it's necessary to cut back tropical milkweed in the late, late fall. And the reason you need to is because uh, milkweed can carry a, um, a, a zoid that, it is, that gets onto butterflies. Um, they, butterfly caterpillars eat it when it's on the leaves. And then when the butterfly grows up, it, it falls off of their wings onto the plants. And so in order to keep down the disease of, uh, <clears throat> of these, um, for these plants, tropical milkweed needs to be cut back in the winter so that that zoya doesn't overwinter. You need to create a water source, source for your pollinators. Bees need a lot of water. They need it for cooling evaporation in the hives, for recrystallizing their honey, for digestion, and to feed the babies. Butterflies need water and minerals, particularly salts, uh, especially by males. Their water, however, has to be very, very shallow. They actually prefer puddles. Sand or small rocks are best. And if you can let, if there's a layer of animal, uh, horse or um, uh, cow poop in there, all the better. You'll often see around uh, stock watering uh, troughs where the water gets spilled, um, where it's kind of muddy, um, maybe poopy. Uh, the butterflies will puddle in there. They really like that. Hummingbirds don't need a water source. Um, however, they love a mister or a fountain spray. Um, I've just held a hose up in the air and they fly in and out of it. They, they love that. Uh, any bird bath, even for birds, should be shallow and not slippery and filled with rocks so that they, birds or pollinators can perch on them. Here's an example of a of a water filled with marbles, decorative mar marbles. Here is one with rocks. Here is a pet feeder for the bees. Here is one that was created by the butterfly lady of California, and it's got rocks and sand, and that she keeps them moist. Uh, the butterflies also like the rocks for getting warm, sitting on, uh, warming up in the morning. Uh, a place in the sun for a basking beauty, rocks. Uh, a walk in the muck, this is what butterflies look like when they're puddling. Here's another waterer. Here's my favorite, I want someone to make me one of these someday. It's very lovely. Um, and it, you just need a little bit of water uh, to keep it moist is all they need for bees too. I uh, just want, I'm almost done. I wanna show you a quick um, uh, two yards that I've redone. 
Uh, this was my older daughter's uh, front yard when she moved in in Redwood City. She had a whole front yard of junipers, 40-year-old junipers. That's all she had. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Uh, we planted um, sages, a couple of different kinds, blue, um, blue and black, which is the one here on the right-hand side, the tall ones. Um, that they really love. Um, here is um, hot lips and uh, some other native plants. In front is um, uh, lamb's ears, which flower and the plants like it. Very hardy, very low water requirements, um, easy to take care of. This is my number two daughter. Um, she bought a house that had a whole front yard of Bermuda grass, nothing but Bermuda grass. Uh, we planted this in lamb's ears again around the edges. Uh, a couple of uh, three uh, very large um, hot lips. And over here on this side, I planted um, red um, sticky flower, sticky monkey. And this is what it looked like about six months after uh, planting. So you can see we had a, had a good winter that year and everything flowered and looks great. So it's possible to do it with just a few plants. This yard is humming all summer long with bees and pollinators and butterflies and all kinds of things. I'd like to thank you all for inviting me here today to make this presentation. And again, if there's any information that you need, uh, Master Gardeners are uh, here to help and I'm happy to take any questions if you have some. Thank you, Cindy, that was, that was really wonderful. There was a lot of um, great information in there. Um, I do have uh, lots of questions that um, I wanna get to. Um, Let's start up here. Um, so the first, it kind of goes back to the bees. Um, do the digger bee males mate with their sisters when they emerge? Yes, they do. <laughs> okay. And, and what I've always wondered is, how do they know which ones to lay so that the males come out first? But <laughs> that's the way it works. Yeah. And then what about bumblebees? I've actually kind of wondered this too. Do they have stingers? Um, I don't believe so. I know there are some that don't. I don't know that all of them don't. But they're, yeah. but they're, but they're, they're yeah. very harmless. They, they really are quite busy doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And they're not looking to bother you. They don't, they, they don't store their honey. So there's no hive for them to protect. Mm -hmm. And then how does the monarch caterpillar get to a tree or elsewhere? It crawls um, over there. It just crawls over there. And, it, and the interesting thing is it usually crawls several feet away from the milkwood plant. Um, so that's why you're likely to see it somewhere in the neighborhood, but not necessarily on the milkwood plant. Uh, that kind of answers the second question because they were asking if should they place branches near the milkweed. No, they'll they'll yeah. they'll climb away, and and you may you may find them in some like oh my god I didn't know it was there kind of places you know. Uh, and someone has a just made a comment that there's always pipe vine swallow larvae at UC Botanical Garden. Okay. Yes. Um, and it says, do you re recommend using bee houses for native bees? Um, I haven't seen a lot of success. I haven't had a lot of success with that. So I, I think, you know, it's certainly, um, you, you know, you can try it and you might get lucky that they come in and find it and then use it in your yard. And then what about uh, California hellbores? Um, are they there? Are these really uh, native California? Uh, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
is it possible to get copies of the slides? I know that the video will be available. Um, is it possible to get the deck? Yes, I can also oh. send you a PDF copy awesome. of the presentation. Okay. Um, and then are any of these plants resistant to deer? Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to look up each one. I, individually <laughs> to see if they are um i fortunately don't have mm. deer here so um that's not been a concern uh i know some of them are because they're native plants but um i think you'd have to look up each one individually i know in the sunset garden books there is a whole list of deer resistant plants Mm. So you could do a cross reference that way between the pollinator plants and the deer resistant to find the ones that are most deer, deer resistant. They have different lists in the front of a sunset garden mm. book, which you can check out at any library. Okay. Um, and then this one here, is it important to plant um, California native milkweed varieties? And I, I actually have a, a addition to that question. Um, if you plant it, will they come? I, you know, like I live on a deck and I thought, well, I could do a container garden or something, or not a deck, but I live in a condo with a deck. And so mm -hmm. will they, will butterflies find these milkweeds? Well, the, remember that the adults are looking for nectar mm -hmm. um, to, to eat. So they'll come to any nectar plant. So if you have a small patio or a deck, you can plant any, any nectar plant and you'll attract them. They're not gonna lay eggs unless you have milkweed. I see. But, but you can attract them to your yard because they're gonna come for the nectar. So herbs or things like that, you could plant on your deck and you could attract them. Borage, I know would bring in the bees. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, in, in regards to, uh, you know, like monarchs, is it important that it is California native milkweed plants? I mean, does it help? No, no, okay. they'll eat any milkweed. Okay. And and they, they can tell it's milkweed by scratching it with their feet. They can mm -hmm. actually smell through their feet. So oh, they'll come and they'll land on the plant and then they'll test it to see if it's milkweed. Hmm, interesting. And milk, milkweed has a chemical in it that the um, caterpillars ingest, and that is why birds leave them alone, because they recognize the color of the caterpillars and the color of the um, monarch butterflies themselves, and they know that they taste bad. So because of this chemical that's in the milkweed. Hmm. Interesting. Um, how do you get rid of Bermuda grass? This is a little bit off of the topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long process. You have to really <laughs> dig it up, and uh, I could imagine. And um, I, the 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 part of my yard that I converted to my bee butterfly garden, I covered it um, with um, very very thick cardboard, and mm -hmm. I left it there for over a year um, to mm -hmm. kill. <clears throat> to kill the Bermuda grass. I had to, to make sure that it was completely covered. There were no little holes that the sunlight could get through. And, you know, every once in a while, take it off, pull, pull out anything, anything that was left, cover it again until I completely killed it. Mm. Not an easy task. <laughs> I, I kind of had this question too. So the shallow water containers, is there a problem with the mosquitoes? I mean, should we be concerned? Um, if it's, I, you, if you put water, if you put rocks or sand in the water, you're not gonna have mosquitoes because they need to lay it in water, in the water itself. Now, if, if you have a pond with water and it's not moving water, yes, you'll need to regularly dump it out and and um, uh, put fresh water in there. Um, somebody is uh, thanking you for your excellent presentation. It was very um, interesting. Um, Thank you. Uh, it says the pesticides are used just around the house foundation. Is that still a problem? Technically, yes. Okay. 
But, you know, uh, you have to recognize that even if it says this is an ant spray, it will kill other mm -hmm. um, other insects as well. Um, but if you're gonna if you're gonna spray just around the base of your house and not the rest of your yard and far away from your garden, mm -hmm. uh, you know that is preferable, obviously. Okay. But don't don't let the the spray guy be all alone out in your backyard <laughs> spraying wherever he wants because yeah. they go crazy. And then uh, can you tell us just a, a bit about the blue butterflies on the San Bruno Mountain? I know that we've actually kind of taken some hikes out there with the uh, assistance. Um, I, I don't know a lot about them, except they're very endangered. Mm -hmm. And I do know that the, the uh, naturalists that support that uh, habitat uh, raise plants there and sell native plants that um, those blue butterflies are uh, need for host plants. So if you're interested um, and you look them up, Mm -hmm. um, if it says San Bruno Blue Butterflies, you'll find their website and you can find when they have um, plant sales and you can mm -hmm. go and buy plants that will attract the blue butterflies and feed them. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, so here's an individual looking for some advice. So that she has a well-established garden with lots of oaks and camellias, azaleas, uh, rhododendrons, and she loves them all, but some of the plants look like they need some TLC. Is there a good source for advice? Uh, she'd love to have a, you know, a consultant come and give advice uh, so she, they could care uh, or, you know, on care uh, if such a source exists. Um, I, I know that from time to time, the master gardeners have classes on mm -hmm. oaks and they also have classes on growing under uh, trees and growing trees for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some, some things available there. Um, master gardeners don't do individual garden consultations uh, unless you're a friend of a master gardener who might come over and give you a consultation. Um, but we are available for specific questions at uh, different locations. If you're in a different county, there are master gardener organizations in every county in California. So you can look them up and find somebody locally that can help you. And maybe they, um, I, I know some of the other counties also have wonderful classes and um, they have open garden days where you can go and meet with them. And hmm. so there's, there's uh, opportunities to get personal consultation um, not necessarily in your garden, but personal to you. Mm -hmm. I know in San Mateo County, um, one Sunday a month, we do it in the botanical garden in San Mateo. So um, we're there in person to give advice. Oh, awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, monkey flowers are short-lived in this individual's garden. Um, any tips? Um, I would take starts in the spring and start growing my own. So I'd have them from year to year. Yes, they are uh, fairly short-lived if it's very, very hot mm. and very sunny. Um, they like it a little cooler, uh, a little moister. And then uh, are, are any of these plants gopher resistant? Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a harder one, but we do give classes on taking care of gophers. So nice. <laughs> it is a possibility. Well, it sounds like the, this, it's a good resource to your, I'm sure the website probably has information um, for individuals. And I, and she has that listed right here. So um, there is uh, some helplines and uh, uh, the website, and I'm sure you could find some of that info. I have just a few more uh, questions. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this one says your daughters are very fortunate to have you. I love that. <laughs> uh, and do butterflies like California poppies? You know, I don't know. I'd, I've never seen a, 
a butterfly on my poppies and I have a lot of poppies. <laughs> so I, I would have to say probably not. Okay, well, I, I think that's it. Um, let's see, I'm gonna ask Dorla to come back on um, and uh, say some final words if she has any. And But thank you, Cindy, this was really great. It was, it's always really uh, fun to have the master gardeners uh, uh, join us for presentations because there are a lot of uh, gardeners in, uh, you know, in our group and um, they really have, you know, get a lot from this information. So you're very welcome. Uh -huh. Oops, Dora, I'm going to ask you to mute. Oops. Hope you're still muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I <laughs> forgot to unmute. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Cindy, for a great presentation that was very, very enjoyable. And um, this is our second talk on uh, from a master gardener. We had someone talk about container gardening uh, a year or two ago, and uh, we're, we'd love to get some more of you folks back and mm -hmm. talk about some of the other topics. I know you have a variety of topics that that where you have people um, presenting. And so anyway, we much appreciate what you've done today. We, it's very, very informative, and we thank you very, very much. You're very welcome. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you soon. Bye.